I was amped up because I almost had to shoot, in my mind, this kid. And it was because he picked up a gun for whatever reason and he threw the AK on the ground. Like he got to like here and then he like saw me and then he threw the AK on the ground. And I went straight at him across the room as the guys fanned out. Nothing wrong with that dude. I would have been well within my rights to smoke him, but he's hopefully still alive today because I trusted my gut and I didn't just do the instinctive thing, which is guy with a gun running in the target area, pull the trigger. You get in, you go to see squadron. Yep. What is that environment like? Uh, super fast. Is um, it welcoming? Nobody was there. So C Squadron was deployed to Afghanistan when I crossed the hall, as they say. So the initial stuff happened right after 9-11. That was a different squadron that did Gecko uh, and all those early incursions into Afghanistan. Um, the next rotation, C took over for them. So in the spring of 02, um, the squadron I got assigned to deployed. So when I finished OTC and went to C Squadron. I didn't even go to Halo School then. Part of the pipeline was after OTC. If you hadn't been, you went to Halo School and and some advanced demolition stuff. And um, I didn't even do those because I got to Squadron. They basically in process us. There was a skeleton crew left there. They equipped us. And then in less than two weeks, I was on a plane headed to Afghanistan. Oh, so you met them Met overseas. my team in combat, yep. Shit. Straight out of school. How? That could be, <laughs> yeah. That could be tough. They could be either very welcoming because yeah. they need you, or they could be, who the fuck is this guy showing up mid-deployment? How, how was it? Mixed bag. Yeah. Uh, the team, fantastic. The team was great. And I think they were all adult enough, experienced enough, and smart enough to know that tonight this guy could be on our left or our right. So it behooves us to be accepting, get him up to speed anywhere that he's not, make sure he's equipped properly, et cetera, et cetera. So the team that I went to was very welcoming. All of them are still longtime friends to this day. Like they were just really, really good dudes. Uh, the troop, so expanding out a little bit. Yeah, sure, there's some practical jokes and some things that occur. Uh, and like, a, who is this guy? Um, but at the end of the day, it was minimal. Uh, and I think it was because they were at war. Like they were forward deployed and, okay, you're part of this, let's go. We don't know when our next hit's gonna be. Um, I think I got lucky that, uh, again, timing, that my first deployment was Afghanistan because back then it wasn't that bad. Like they only did like six or eight hits that entire rotation. I got there about midway through it. So I only did like four mission sets. Really? Um, so I got some training time. Yeah, we did like a recce mission. My first thing with the team was a was a low vis, basically walk in hit, um, and yeah, blew a bunch of doors, threw some flashbangs, didn't pull the trigger. Uh, I didn't pull the trigger once that first rotation to Afghanistan. Um, so I got to integrate with the team. I got to learn. I got to realize how slow I was. Uh, you know, smash into a Afghani door and bust the bridge of my nose and pop the nods off my helmet on my very first target ever. You know, like. <laughs> There's a lot of little moments in there, um, but being at war, joining that organization and a team at war, it was the stuff that you can't get in OTC. It was like, I'm on target in combat, hunting bad dudes, and you know, your troop sergeant major's on the radio and he's deadpan calm. Roger that, this is 2-2, blah, 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 blah. You know, you didn't even get that in the regular army in training. They'd get all fired up when you were at, you know, JRTC, you know, yeah. fake stuff going on. And it was just a, it was a really good way and a very real way to join something like that. When you got to Afghanistan, that's a real, I don't know how long, how long were you there? Or how long was the deployment, if you can say? Oh, their deployment was, well, some guys were there prior doing AFO stuff, and other, but the squadron as a whole, I think, was there for three and a half months. Three um, and a half months. And I only caught, like, the tail end, so like a month and a half of that. Maybe eight hits in three and a half months. Were you, were you expecting more when you got there? Yeah, I was. Were you disappointed? No. No? No. Um, we did enough that... I mean, because don't get me wrong, like I was nervous and every night out, like I didn't know. Yeah. Even though the guys had said, you know, like some things that happened, there was a couple little things that had happened. But yeah, I mean, I, w I wasn't disappointed. I felt like we got to do a little of a bunch of different things. 
You know, there was some funny stuff that happened, but I felt like I got to integrate with my team and get to know those guys. Because, you, know, you know, on a deployment, you get to know people on a different level. Mm-hmm. It's not like being home stateside where you go home every night. Like you're with them 24-7. So for me, I was really grateful, like, for the way that it all worked out. Just getting to know those guys on that level, being forced to get up to speed as quickly as possible. Because uh, you come at OTC and you think you're hot shit. And then you get there and you realize, oh, my God. I had no idea how good these guys were at this, and I feel like they didn't teach me anything again. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yeah, but but yeah, you quickly quickly adapt and and become a part of it, and and then we we I think we redeployed in like July time frame, shortly after July fourth, uh, and then that summer was basically when the churn started for prepping to potentially invade Iraq. Before we go to Iraq. You showed up in a combat zone at the, you know, the most capable unit in the fucking world. Probably nervous. Terribly. You know, nervous that the team's not going to like you. Nervous that you're going to combat. Yeah. Usually, from my own experience, when I see people show up <coughs> mid-deployment, uh, including myself, I've done it, and you're new, you're usually drawn to one particular person that kind of takes you under their wing. Sure. What was that for you? Uh, it, yeah, it was it was Brad Thomas. If if you know folks out there have heard Brad's name, um, Brad started the band Silence in the Light. Um, you know, hundred percent of the proceeds from their music goes to charity. And Brad, uh, I was from Delaware. Brad was from Maryland. Um, Brad was a Somali vet. You know, ninety three was in Bico three seven five during the Black Hawk Down incident on October third. Uh, and lived through all that and then hung around and eventually became a unit operator and uh, yeah like he'd been through some stuff and so I looked up to him right away Um, he sort of took me in right away and and we were pretty tight back then like I looked up to him like a big brother still do to this day Um, but my whole team then like like all those guys were just solid uh, and very helpful and all a little different in their own way Um, and and yeah we all do a pretty good job of hanging on even all these years later. Like that first team, we were together in combat for multiple rotations after that. Uh, and that didn't happen later on. Like guys would come and go or get injured or whatever. But but yeah, that core group of like four guys I was with for three or four combat rotations. And, and yeah, Brad was always kind of there as a mentor. What was one of the, what was one of the biggest lessons you've learned or you learned on that deployment maybe through humiliation? Like fuck! I can't believe I just did that. Did you did you make any of those mistakes on that first deployment? Uh, I think the biggest lesson for me was trust your instincts. So I was on a rooftop, my very first target. Like I said, I'd already busted my nose and torn my nods off my head and whatever. Tried to put them back together, but we were on the rooftop pulling security, and uh, I was like right side security, looking like north down this road. Uh, I think we had some rangers in a couple blocking positions, or maybe the recce troop guys. We had some snipers or something out. Um, and again, no shots fired, but we had aggressively taken this target down and, and secured some detainees and were just waiting to exfil, basically. And this guy came running down the road with an AK, and I was the only one that saw him. And I said to, to Mikey, a teammate of mine, I said, hey, uh, there's a dude running down the road with an AK. And something about it just didn't feel right. Like, he wasn't like he was running to get in the fight. It was like he was running to come look or like see how he could help. There was just something about his body language. And again, I'm a brand new guy in combat. And I said, so this guy running down the road with an AK, and Mikey, not looking in that direction, goes, so shoot him. (laughs) Well within my rights, right? Yep. He's coming into our target area, rules of engagement. I was good. Totally could have smoked that guy. It just didn't feel right. And so I yelled back, I go, I don't think he needs to be shot. And then Mikey being, you know, a solid dude, I think radioed down and said, hey, there's a dude coming up the street because I'm, you know, oblivious, radioed down to the guys on that corner and said, this guy coming up the street with an AK. Well, they ended up stopping him. They didn't shoot him. They just stopped him. He was like the local law enforcement. He was actually a f- friendly to us and a guy that had worked with, you know, U.S. forces over there. And he just heard all the noises and commotion and thought somebody was in trouble and he needed to come help and he was coming down the road to investigate. So nothing wrong with that dude. I would have been well within my rights to smoke him, but he's hopefully still alive today because I trusted my gut and I didn't just do the instinctive thing, which is guy with a gun running in the target area, pull the trigger. Um, but but yeah, for the most part, it taught me to trust my gut. 
Where do you regret not pulling the trigger? Uh, years later in Iraq, um, we hit a target in Fallujah, uh, and we were chasing a bomb maker, and we didn't know really anything about him. We had like a name, we had no image, we didn't know age, like none of that stuff. We had some, some familial tie and a name. And we hit this house, um, and there was a bunch of people in the house. And when I made entry into the room, across the room there was a doorway, and this kid, to me, I mean kid, baby face, and I'm a, I was a baby face guy and a young guy at the time, and I wouldn't have guessed he was but 14 years old. Um, but he reached down and grabbed an AK, and I basically went from the high ready to on him to off safe, and I yelled, don't do it, and he threw the AK on the ground. Like he got to like here, and then he like saw me, and then he threw the AK on the ground, and I went straight at him across the room as the guys fanned out. And I, I think I pushed him initially, and he fell down, um, and then I kicked him a number of times. And it was I was amped up because I almost had to shoot, in my mind, this kid. And it was because he picked up a gun for whatever reason. So I was mad at him, so I was kicking him. Not like really aggressively, just like, I can't believe you would do that kind yeah. of thing, you know what I mean? And another teammate grabbed me. And, and was like, hey, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool. And we picked him up and, and flex scuffed him or whatever and then went on with the target. Well, it turns out, so that dude was, he was just a young baby face guy, but he was like the area expert on IED construction. Shit. And he had been building bombs and they had this garage facility where they were building those bombs and blah, 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 blah. But uh, they put him, not us, another group of guys put him in a vehicle um, the next day to take him out and do a close target reconnaissance and get him to point out where all these facilities were and But yeah, but yeah, I carried that and went man if I, who knows like should I have shot that guy? Like yeah, he gave me the opportunity I would have been well within my rights He picked that weapon up like he was gonna use it I just gave him a split second long enough to get rid of it and he didn't get shot Damn What year were you guys in Afghanistan? That was 02. 02? Oh, yeah. shit. This is very early. Yeah, that was super early. Yeah, that was like OIF-1. Like I said, c Squadron was like this. I think they were the second rotation from our unit to go over. Okay. Um, b Squadron had done Gecko prior. What? So, eight hits. I don't know how target-rich that environment was at that particular time. I was, uh, I was still in training. But I would think there would be a lot of targets. What? What was special about those eight targets? to send a tier one asset after Good them. question. And I, and I don't even remember. At one point we laughed. At one point we did a route reconnaissance. Okay, okay. Yeah, and I remember the, the older guys all bitching that you're sending the most highly trained individuals in the world to do a route recon to confirm if a bridge is out or not. Shit. Um, looking back, hindsight, I think it was a combination of things. You know, we had limited assets at that point. Our collection capability was nothing like it was several years later. We didn't have eyes overhead. You know, we had like a P3 Orion at 10,000 feet because of the hard deck was like 9,500 feet because they were worried of Stinger missiles and all that stuff. Like it was a real, real early time. Uh, and I think they were coming up with stuff to do. So, like, before I got there, they did some joint stuff with the, with the Kiwis, with New Zealand SAS, like some mobility stuff down south. We did a route reconnaissance. We did a, a recce mission where we inserted and, like, went up in the hills and did some observation. We did a couple of hits, you know, and the hit was like a low-vis hit. So, for me, I was like, this is cool. Like, I'm in <laughs> low-vis is the funniest term ever, right? It's, yeah. it's white guys in body armor and civilian clothes. <laughs> <laughs> We're low vis, yeah. you know, in, in, in Tacomas or whatever, Hiluxes yeah. or whatever. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.